Good morning, Zadiri. Can you hear me? Hello. Junius, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you so much. And hear me? Ah, uh, yes, you can. Okay, Eric is on now. Hello, Eric. Happy Sabbath. Brother Eric, can you hear me? Hello, Sammy. Hello, Eric. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can get you now. Thank you so much. And so we praise the Lord uh, for giving us this Sabbath, and uh, uh, we want just to go to the presentation direct because uh, we are seven minutes past, and so I'll uh, hand over to you for this session, and uh, may the Lord be with you. Thank you, Sammy. So, uh, sorry for the slight delay. But uh, we thank God for the far that he has brought us. Uh, we will uh, begin by having a word of prayer. If you can, we can kneel as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you to thank you once again for the opportunity that you have granted us to see this Sabbath, Father, and rest from our works, Father, both physical and redemptive, Father, at rest in the finished work, Father, that has been done for us and his righteousness. Father, as we continue to delve into these topics, Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to enlarge our understanding, Father, and lead us into the right paths, Father, that our understanding may lead to the proper experience. We, those who are worshipping, Father, throughout the world this day, for this is our prayer, trusting and believing in the precious name of Christ. Amen. Amen. So we are continuing with our studies on the theme of uh, overcoming sin and justification by faith. And uh, today we want to look at what is righteousness, which is uh, actually what we probably should have begun with. 
what is righteousness? Because th this is what we actually are seeking uh, to have. This righteousness that we are seeking, we must be able to define it. Where do we get the understanding of what we believe it to be? And we have to go back into the Bible once again and uh, the spirit of prophecy and get what is it that we actually are seeking. Then we will be able to understand how we can be able to have this important article that is referred to as righteousness. You remember that statement that we got from the spirit of prophecy that had been uh, quoted by Elder Daniels in his book, Christ, uh, Our Righteousness, that uh, they have not been properly instructed that Christ is both, is unto them both salvation and righteousness. That is forgiveness and righteousness. So Christ does not just forgive us. He forgives us, yes, but then he also is to be our righteousness. So this is a very interesting uh, topic because people, as uh, we have been seeing, usually define righteousness depending on their own what experience, which we say is a very uh, tricky thing to do. We need to get our experience in line with what the Bible says and not the other uh, way around. So for many Adventists, if you ask them, what is righteousness? The first thing that will come to mind is that righteousness has to do with the law of God. In fact, in the book Christ Object Lessons, page 312, that we had uh, looked at before, we are told that righteousness is right doing. Righteousness is right doing. And in First uh, John 5.17, we are told that all unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. So if unrighteousness is sin, then righteousness must be obedience to the law. And if sin is the trans, because sin is basically the transgression of the law, that is the, the, the definition of sin, the biblical definition of sin, that sin is the transgression of the law. So if all unrighteousness is sin, then it is easy to understand that righteousness must have something to do with the law. It is a right doing according to what? To the law. So we are correct actually in attaching the concept of righteousness to obedience, obedience uh, <clears throat> to the law. But then that is where the problem uh, comes in because we immediately begin to check ourselves using the law. And uh, mostly it is the letter of the law, the outward uh, visible uh, 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 issues that have to do with the law. Hmm? Am I breaking the Sabbath by my actions or my behavior? Am I lying? Have I told lies? Is taking a particular thing uh, stealing? is using certain expressions, taking the name of God in, in vain. And therefore that is what, that is the catalog that we, uh, we develop, this long checklist of what we are supposed to do and what we are not supposed to be doing. And then we examine ourselves in this uh, light. So that if we find something that we are not living up to, that is uh, clearly required by the law, then we feel like we are not what? We are not righteous, we are violating, and uh, we definitely begin a campaign against it in order to get right with what uh, we are supposed to be doing. So if, if, if this is what we understand, then uh, it, it might differ with what we want to see today, what the Bible actually says and what we get from the uh, spirit of prophecy. If you are lucky, by the way, you had a catalog or a checklist, and then we ask God for help and you overcome in that area. So does it mean that once I overcame, now I'm righteous as regards to that particular issue that I had a challenge with? So if, if is that righteousness? And we believe that hopefully, as long as we live, we have this checklist, and uh, as long as we live, we will finally be able to 
get over these uh, areas that we actually transgress the law. But we are told in the Bible that this is not exactly what uh, uh, the Bible teaches to be righteousness, because many people have tried to do this for many years and they have uh, actually failed. So the question is, is the absence of sin righteousness? If you cannot be able to find sin in your life, that is the outward uh, uh, obedience of the law. If you cannot be able to find that in your life, is that, are, are you righteous? Is righteousness established by stealing, by not stealing, by not committing? So you'll find that most people, once they get into this trap, you'll find that they, this is exactly what uh, they believe, that righteousness is not doing. Thou shalt not. And if they are doing well in this area, then they take themselves to be, uh, to be righteous. So, but if this is exactly what uh, we believe, then we will join the, the monks in their monasteries so that we are, we, we are put away from any place in which we might be tempted to do these things. Because there we will be living alone and we are free from uh, the temptation to do these things. We are not in mingling with the society for which we have been put by the way into the world so that we can be able to share with them this righteousness that uh, is there. So in a closed up place in a monastery, there are no temptations to steal. And there are many things that you cannot be able to, uh, to do. But we'll find that righteousness as defined in the Bible is not the absence of, of sin. When Christ actually looked at obedience to the law as being righteousness, he discussed the law as he understood it. And no one knows the law very well uh, uh, more than Christ. He understood it because he was the giver of the law. In the book of Matthew 22, 36, that uh, incident that we have discussed before, where a lawyer came to him and asked, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? That is Matthew 22, 36. Then Jesus, 37 to 40, Jesus uh, says unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And then the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Then Christ says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now notice here what Jesus is talking about. Christ is here addressing obedience to the law. But look at how he looks at it. He is teaching the right concept of the law. That the right concept of the law is embodied in the supreme love for God and loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. Now, this is the right concept of, of righteousness. It is not the avoidance of doing things that the law actually says we should be able to not to do or to avoid. So to Jesus here, the keeping of the law was not omission of sin. It was the doing. It is not thou shalt not. It is thou shalt. It is doing. And doing of what? Doing of good. So here Jesus is teaching clearly that elimination of sin is not righteousness. And we often forget what Jesus says again in Luke 11, 24, about the devils being cast out and leaving the person empty. Remember the case that we had also looked at. And then the devils, one devil goes and gets others and they come in and they fill the void. Just because the sin had been gone did not mean that there was any righteousness in there. When all the sin is gone, the person was empty because Christ says that they find the house what? Empty. The house can only be filled by two people, either the devils or a divine occupant. And when it is empty, that is only a step. But then the person has to choose who has to occupy that house. And when it is empty, there is no righteousness in it still. So when all the sin is gone, the person is only empty. There is no good there. The life is empty. 
of sin. Righteousness is more than that. It is more than the elimination of the sin in our lives. It is not a negative. That is not killing, not stealing, but it is a positive. It moves you to the other side of the spectrum. It is love for God and the love for fellow man, which leads you to do acts of love with an unselfish what? With an unselfish uh, motive. So here we see that righteousness is more than a profession. In Matthew 7, 21, Christ also talks about those who professed but did not do. And he talks about two men where one said he will do it, but he did not do it. The other fellow said he will not, but he did. Jesus says that the one who did it was blessed. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Notice what we are studying today. It has to do with the doing. Doing the will of my Father which is in heaven. The doers are the ones that are blessed. It is not enough to eliminate the wrongdoing into our lives. There must come this loving, right doing, or still I will not be righteous. It is not the discontinuance of acts of transgression, but the doing of acts of love, both to God and to fellow man. So this is the right concept of righteousness that Christ is teaching here. It is not uh, the elimination of the negative things as uh, described in, in the law. So we are told uh, in the Mount of Blessings, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 58. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 58. That the love of God, the love of God is something more than a mere negation. Yes. The love of God is something more than a mere negation. It is a positive and active principle. A living spring, ever flowing to bless others. If the love of Christ dwells in us, we shall not only cherish no hatred toward our fellows, but we shall seek in every way to manifest love toward them. That is what it says. That if the love of Christ dwells in us, we shall not only cherish no hatred towards our fellows, elimination of the negative, comma, but we shall seek in every way to manifest love toward them. So it will be a manifestation of love on top of the elimination of the negatives. So in other words, if you really love someone because the love of Christ is in you, you will not only avoid doing wrong to them, harm to them, but you will have every opportunity that will be open to you to do them good. Now, this is a different kind of righteousness. Yet, you find that most of the time, we have been praying to God to just keep us from doing the wrong things, and that is where we do what? We stop, but the righteousness that we find here is different from many of us, suppose, and we want to see in some of the quotations our inability to be righteous and how different righteousness is from what we have been led to believe. In Steps to Christ, there's another interesting quote, page 62. Steps to Christ, page 62. We are told that because of his, Adam's sin, our natures are fallen. We cannot make ourselves righteous. Because of Adam's sin, his sin, our natures are fallen. We cannot make ourselves righteous. Since we are sinful and holy, we cannot perfectly obey the holy law. We have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of the law of God. Steps to Christ, page 62. So basically, we are being told here, we do not have the equipment to do it because we have fallen natures, because of Adam's sin. We are ill-equipped, and all our attempts at obeying the law are only destined to failure. 
in Mount of Blessings, page 50. Mount of Blessing, thought from the Mount of Blessings, page 50. We also have this quotation. That because the law of the Lord is perfect, therefore changeless, it is impossible for sinful men in themselves to meet the standard of its requirement. Because the law of the Lord is perfect, therefore changeless, it is impossible for sinful men in themselves to meet the standard of its requirement. So in other words, the law is too holy for me to meet its requirements. If you go down to page 54 of the Mount of Blessings, thoughts from Mount of Blessings, she continues that the law of God is as holy as he is holy. The law of God is as holy as he is holy, as perfect as he is perfect. Page 58, sorry, Mount of Blessings, 54, 54. Where it begins by saying the law of God is as holy as he is holy. Yes, yes. As perfect as he is perfect. It prevent, presents to men the righteousness of God. The law presents to men the righteousness of, who, of God. It is impossible for man of himself to keep this law. For the nature of man is depraved, deformed, and wholly unlike the character of God. So here we are seeing that the only natural thing with us is to do the opposite of what the law does what, of what the law requires. Paul also talks about this in the book of Romans. Romans 3, 9 and 10, where he says, what then, are we better than they That is, are the Gentiles better than the Jews? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and the Gentiles that they are all under sin, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So neither Jew nor Gentile is righteous. Paul is saying, it does not matter whether you are a Jew or a, or a Gentile. We are all under sin as it is written, there is none righteous, not one. Now this is a bit discouraging for those who are trying to be righteous by their own efforts. Because we are told it is impossible, we are trying an impossibility. But there is hope because Paul puts us, puts us in a condition whereby we actually see our true position before the law before he finally actually gives the solution. If you read on in Romans chapter three, it continues talking about our unrighteousness and our inability to keep the law of God. After verse 20 comes a transition where there is a very unique thing taking place. So in the first 20 verses, Paul is discussing the unrighteous. Then it changes in verse 21 with that uh, word, but. Huh? That little word that changes the trajectory of what, where someone was heading. It says, but now the righteousness of God. So it first talks about the unrighteousness of man and all of man's attempts to be righteous. Then it says, but now, as in something else has happened, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. The righteousness of God without the law, now is made, is made known or is made manifest. And this righteousness, notice, is for us, those whom he was discussing previously, those who are non-righteous and are trying to attain to this righteousness or level of righteousness. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. So Paul is talking about people who try to be righteous, that he has said there is none who is righteous and we all try to be. And sometimes we think we are, but we are not. He said that this does not mean that all is lost because it 
brings us to verse 21 where he turns uh, the, he, he changes the direction in which the conversation was going to where now we can have hope and for us to see where this righteousness of God that is without the law is what? Is manifested. There is a better kind of righteousness than us who do not have and cannot attain to this righteousness are always attain, trying in our own strength to attain to. And this is the righteousness of God, which is unto all and upon all that do it, that believe. And it comes by faith of Jesus Christ. So this is, the, is not the righteousness of some person billion miles away. Because Philippians 3.9, if you read Philippians 3.9 and you put it together with Romans 3, then you will better understand about this. Because Paul prays about what he might possess when he finishes this life. And this is the favorite text that we've been looking at. And be found in him, Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, as in my attempts to keep it, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Paul says a human being can have this righteousness. It is unto all that do what? That believe. He said he did not want his own righteousness. Because he could not attain in his own strength. He only wanted to be found with the righteousness of God by faith in hope. In Jesus, as human, is in divinity. But as Christ lived that godly life, righteousness was found in a human being who lived just like we have to live upon this earth. And that means that this righteousness can be for us, and it comes to us in the person of, of Jesus. Paul is saying in Romans 3 that God is asking why we strive to keep the law when we are all sinners and are unrighteous. Hmm? So God is standing there waiting to give you his righteousness in the person of Jesus. We have to trade one for the other. Our righteousness does not meet the demands of the law. The one that meets the demands of the law is of God in Christ Jesus, and he seeks to trade this uh, for our own that cannot meet that standard. So what, we should not be striving to achieve our own righteousness when God is freely offering something much better and something that meets the demands of that law. Now, do you know, by the way, that Jesus did not claim his righteousness was his own? Read with me the book of John 14, 9 and 10. John 14, 9 and 10. Jesus saith unto him, Philip, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So the words and righteous works cease. Were not his, but the righteousness of the Father in whom. 8.28. And John 5 thought, in John 8.28, it says, Then shall ye know that I do nothing of myself, but as my things. And then, and then in John 5.19, he says, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he as in the Father doeth, this also doeth the Son likewise. So therefore, the words that Christ spoke and the acts that he performed of righteousness were not his. They were the righteousness of God, the Father in Jesus. And this is the righteousness that is offered also to, to us. So this is the righteousness of God. This is the righteousness that meets the demands of the law. The law of who? The law of God. Why? 
let us look at the reason why this has to be uh, so. In first selected messages, page 198, first selected messages, page 198, because this is the same righteousness that has to get us to heaven. Ellen White writes, first selected messages, 198, that the righteousness of God is absolute. The righteousness of God is absolute. This righteousness characterizes all his works, all his laws. This righteousness characterizes all his works, all his what? All his laws. As God is, so must his people be. Now, what does the word absolute mean? Absolute. I remember when I was doing, uh, studying economics, where we had this, uh, this, uh, for example, it was used in absolute, absolute poverty. And then you have uh, poverty that you compare yourself with another, with another person, relative poverty or absolute poverty. This absolute means it is not dependent on another thing or it is not relative to another. It is determined in itself. It is the ultimate and intrinsic. So here we see that the righteousness of God is absolute. There is no comparison. It is the highest. It is the ultimate righteousness. It is intrinsic in God himself as absolute moral what? Absolute moral law. There is nothing more exalted or inherent in itself and in himself apart from this. Another definition of absolute is that it says all reality considered as the final or total fact or existence. So this righteousness of God is the final or total fact of righteousness. There is nothing after it and there is nothing that is more complete. So when you look at this, all the definitions, by the way, of this noun that the spirit of prophecy has used uh, here, that is absolute, you come to the conclusion that this word characterizes all the works of God and all his laws too. Because the law is absolute. There is nothing greater and nothing more, more perfect. And do you think that you can be able to keep this law that is absolute, like we have seen? This is something that is impossible to do. Man that has inherited a fallen nature because of Adam's sin, we are told, we have read from the Bible, is totally deceived to think that he can be able on his own to keep this law. One has to be a very good Pharisee and one has to be very deceived to think that he can be able to meet the standards of such uh, a law. So in our lack of repeating what uh, we are dread, that we have not been instructed is to be and to us both salvation and opinion because of the experiences that we also go through uh, in the church. So we, we think that we exalt the law when actually we are depreciating it. Once you entertain the idea that you can have your own righteousness, that you can meet the demands of the law by yourself, then it means that you are degrading this law uh, of God. But the law has to be presented properly as the epitome of righteousness. It is impossible to keep. And I think that is the intention. Why Paul speaks about the impossibility. It is not to discourage people, but so that they later on should not be able to develop the idea that on their own, they can be able to meet that, the demands of that law. We have been degrading this law for years when we think that we can be able to 
keep it. The law is too perfect, it is too high. And we are only depreciating God who is the giver of that law and his marvelous law, which is a transcript of his character and undermining his government by thinking that we can be able to keep it, especially in our fallen nature. The law must be put back where it belongs. That is in its absolute position. In Christ Object Lessons, page 315, Ellen White continues, which we are sure we are familiar with, that his law is a transcript of his own character. We always say that as Adventists, I'm sure this is one statement that nearly all the Adventists know because of the Sabbath, that the law, his law is a transcript of his own character. But then we don't think this way, that any obedience to God's law then must be a likeness to God. If the law is God's character written down, then obedience to that law makes you like who? Like God. Obedience to this law is likeness to God. Therefore, true obedience must be God-likeness. And this is what John talks about in 1 John 3, 2. He says, But beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we shall know that when he, Jesus, shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. If we are like Jesus, and Jesus is the one who said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Remember in John 14, 19. Then if you are like Jesus, we are like the Father. And the law keeping is having the character of God or God likeness. This character, this law is absolute. And this righteousness, this obedience to God's law is God likeness. It just has to be like that. So this character, transcript of his own character, the law is a transcript of God's character. This character, the law is absolute. And the righteousness, the obedience to this law must also be God-likeness. We must be able to be like God. Now, from another perspective, remember John 4, 8, so that we get what righteousness of God really is, which we had looked at also last week. John taught that God is love, First John 4, 8. Now this is John, the beloved prophet, who is describing God. And this is one prophet whom we can say knew God well because he knew Jesus so well. He proclaims that God is love. I mean, he looked for a word to describe God and he found the word love to describe the whole character of God, of which the law, love to God and to fellow man, and then 10 of them, and then the rest of the Bible, is a more lengthy description. The laws and the statutes that we find in the Bible are a lengthy description of this character of God, of which is what? Is love. Remember, in Exodus 34, uh, when Moses asked to see God, and he shown the character of God when we do 37. Jesus says as thy what? As thyself. Because God has also to be what? To be love. And in whom the Father dwelt was love. And so he knew that. And that is why Paul says that the law in Romans 13 10. Love is perfect obedience to the law. It is supreme love to God and love for your what? Love to your neighbor. That fulfills, fulfills the law. So what are we concluding? One conclusion. Love is righteousness. And righteousness is what? Is love. If God is love and the law describes his character and the law is the character of love and obedience to that law is love, 
and obedience is righteousness, then righteousness has to be love. It means that we have been trying to do what is called righteousness. Somehow we were not getting what, what, what was required of us. We were missing the point. Righteousness, if it is love, is not trying to, av to, to avoid the heart or, or coveting all these things that the law requires. Righteousness is doing good things for somebody in way that you can think of and in every opportunity that arises. That is righteousness. Because righteousness is what? It's love. Matthew 5, 6. Christ says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be, for they shall be filled. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be, for they shall be. Now listen to Ellen White's commentary on this in Mount of GT. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 18. Ellen White has some interesting comments on this beatitude. She says, righteousness is holiness, likeness to God, and God is love. First John 4.16. It, that is righteousness, is conformity to the law of God. It, the righteousness, is conformity to the law of God. For all thy commandments are righteousness. That is Psalm 119, 172. And love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans 13, 10. So righteousness is love, and love is the light and the life of God. So the righteousness of God is embodied in Christ. That is love, you see. So we receive righteousness by receiving him. Repeating, righteousness is holiness, likeness to God, and God is love. It is conformity to the law of God, for all thy commandments are righteousness. And love is the fulfilling of the law. So righteousness is love. And love is the light and the life of God. The righteousness of God is embodied in Christ. We receive righteousness by receiving him. Righteousness here in the spirit of prophecy, we are told clearly that it is what? It is love. So God, and God is love. Then righteousness is love. So we need to keep in our minds this truth that righteousness is love. Get it. Instead of long pursuing righteousness, in our own way, we need to rediscover that righteousness is what? It's love. If there is love in my heart, and this is divine love, planted by Jesus, then there will be love for you. Then there will be love for my neighbor. Then there will be love for other people. Because Christ loves me tremendously. When there is love in my heart for you, I will find it difficult to lie to you. I will find it impossible to kill you, I will find it to backbite you, where this is, this is what should prompt us. And with this prompting, love from God will come the enabling that will also ensure that we do not do what the law says that we should not be able to do what to do. It is not an attempt to make the outside look or flawless. We are beginning from the wrong end. We need to be from where? From the inside. It is goodness from the inside coming out of the heart that embraces and loves humanity. This is the real Christianity. That is, we are told the world is waiting to see in the last days. It is the third angel's message in what? In verity, we are also told. So there are people who are dying for real Christianity because they can see and find so little of it. And God is waiting for his people to manifest this love to the world. 
it is becoming worse because the churches do not offer this love of Christ that is supposed to be changing our lives. We are so busy with other things and then we keep out love that was manifested by God sending his son to come and die for us. So this is a different understanding of righteousness than most of us follow in our lives by our experience, just by the mere fact that these things are not constantly us and other members of the church. It is a law of love, the Ten Commandments. So obedience to that law must be loving people who will not be doing what the law prohibits us from doing to other people. There is another statement in the spirit of prophecy that teaches that righteousness is love. It is found in Steps to Christ, page 60. The following. But notice here that obedience is not a mere outward compliance but the service of love. Steps to Christ, page 60. <clears throat> but notice here that obedience is not a mere, which means it is, but not just that, not, not, not that alone. Notice here that obedience is not just outward compliance, but the service of what? Of love. So we need to seize from this, looking at the outward compliance. We need to get into the source. How can our hearts be transformed, they change to the extent, the extent that love that we have can flow out to others. The Lord of God is an expression of his very nature. It is an embodiment of the great principle of love. And hence, it is the foundation of his government in heaven and earth. If our hearts are renewed in the likeness of God, that is talking about the new birth, if the divine love is implanted in the soul, will not the law of God be carried out in the life? Will we not carry out the law of God in our lives? So when the principle of love in, is implanted in the heart, when a man is renewed after the image of him that created him, the new covenant promise is fulfilled. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds. Will I do what? Will I write them? And if written in the heart, will it not shape the life? Obedience, the service and allegiance of life, of love, sorry, is the true sign of what? Of discipleship. So notice what, how she breaks down these issues. Obedience, obedience, which is the true sign of discipleship, should be the service and allegiance of what? Of love. It should not be from our own effort trying to keep the out externalities of the what? Of the law. So obedience is the service and the legends of love. This is a different kind of obedience than the one that we are used to. This is because if someone serving us a, a, a help at home or in the farm, he is serving you not just uh, because you, you, you are paying, them, but because of love. How does that feel? That is what God requires of us also. We need to serve people because we love them. It is good to give this love, but it is better to give. It is much blessed, says the Bible, to give than to do what? Than to receive. There is a double blessing when we give instead of when we receive. Now you remember in Romans 3.10 where it says, there is none righteous. Now if you were to use this definition that righteousness is love, it says, there is none who does what? Who loves? Paul said we are no better than the Jews. The Jews did not love and we also do not do what? We do not have this kind of love that is required here by the law. That is righteousness. So we, we, we do not have it. An example, and this, this is something that 
can be demonstrated since the fall of Adam. In fact, the very day that Adam and Eve sinned, when God comes to ask Adam, where are you? Adam throws Eve under the bus, that it is Eve that did what? That did it. And Eve says that the serpent did it. There was no love between the two of them because you cannot throw someone that you love under the what? Under the bus. These people now were not brought together. They were not to be together because of the love that initially they possessed one for another. But it is because they were in the same predicament. Now, just one generation after that, you find that the sons of this couple, our parents, one hates his brother so much to the extent that he kills his brother. Why? Because one sin brought about this degeneracy and love was gone. And in a span of one generation, we see the complete opposite of love that is taking the life of someone. Now, what about after 6,000 years of sin? We do not possess this thing called love. If one sin brought about such a lack of love, what has 6,000 years of degeneracy accomplished? So our understanding of love is also so feeble that we need to go back to the scripture to learn what exactly this love entails. And this love, we are told, is righteousness. So when the Bible says there is none righteous, it means there is none who is loving, who possesses that kind of love in their heart. We find selfishness always in our heart. In our hearts coming up, the love that is of God is a self denouncing love, but love that others. It plans good things for other people. The genuine love that Christ demonstrated while he was upon this earth. It is a most unusual type of love. Now, if we look at the life of Christ, by the way, and this is why we are told we should dwell upon the life of Christ, especially the closing, the closing scenes, because we do not possess this kind of love. We cannot have it in and of ourselves. So if one sin called, caused all this separation and caused that love to flee away from Adam's heart, just think how we have been chasing love out of our lives for years. We can't produce it. And yet this is the kind of love that you're told is the fulfillment of God's law. It is perfect righteousness. So where does it come from? It comes from Jesus. No wonder Jesus says in 1 John 13, 34, which we have also looked at, that a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. He came and showed the disciples how they ought to love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one, one another. And how did Jesus love? How can I love like Jesus loved? I can't. I might be able to attempt to do it maybe once in a while, but for selfish reasons. But look at the life of Jesus. All day long caring for people. The people that you care for, some of them hate you, like his family. The nation hates him, but he loved them. It did not matter who they are. The people that his nation hated, he interacts with and loves them. They called them dogs. These are the people that Christ came and taught to love. On Calvary's cross, he says, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. Now, this is the kind of love that we are to have. This is a different kind of love than man can ever conceive. Not manufactured. You cannot plan for it and you cannot have it. It must come from God and we must be able to receive it from God. Because it says God so loved the world that he gave to us his only begotten word, son. His love for us was in Jesus. Righteousness is found in Jesus. We receive righteousness by receiving him. Love is found in Jesus. We receive love by receiving, receiving him. I cannot do something that takes the place of it. I must receive it until it changes and transforms my and makes me love those I once did what? 
I once hated. Then for various reasons, especially these last days, where we have such right is wrong, darkness is light, and everything is upside down and opposite. A whole transformation must be. Why? Because the love of Christ has been received into the soul. We are told in Mount of Blessing, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 54 and 55. Ellen White says that while the law is holy, the Jews could not attain righteousness by their own efforts to keep the law. The disciples of Christ must obtain righteousness of a different character from that of the Pharisees if they would enter the kingdom of heaven. God offered in his son the perfect righteousness of the law. God offered in his son the perfect righteousness of the law. If they would open their hearts fully to receive Christ, then the very life of God, notice Ellen White is saying, his love would dwell in them. Then what does it do once it dwells in them? Transforming them into his own likeness. And thus through this free gift, they would possess the righteousness which the law requires. So see the steps here. While the law is holy, we have seen that, the Jews could not attain righteousness by their own efforts to keep the law. We have seen that that is impossible. The disciples of Christ must obtain righteousness of a different character from that of the Pharisees if they would enter the kingdom of heaven. What is the righteousness by which we shall enter into heaven? This is the righteousness. God offered in his son the perfect righteousness of the law. If they would open their hearts to fully receive Christ, then the very life of God, his love would dwell in them, transforming them into his own likeness. And thus, through God's free gift, they would possess the righteousness which the law requires, and I might add the righteousness by which we are to enter the kingdom of where? Of heaven. Not our righteousness. So righteousness here and love are in Jesus. When you open your heart to receive Jesus, you receive the very life of God. You receive the very love of God. They abide in you and it, they change and transform your life until that very righteousness that the law requires is demonstrated in your what? In your life. It's demonstrated in your life. So all that we are trying to say in defining righteousness here is wrapped up in the Sermon on the Mount and especially the conclusion of that someone, that what is righteousness, it is love. That is obedience to the law, for the law, of, for the law is, is love. It is the character of the Father, and that is love. It is likeness to God, because that is love. All of this is wrapped up in one very statement in Matthew 5, 48, that says, be ye perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is what? Is perfect, which we want to finish by quickly looking at. Matthew 5, 48 says, that be ye even as your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Christ could have said many things. He could have said, be ye righteous, even as your father in heaven is what? Is righteous. Be ye loving, even as your father in heaven is what? Is loving. But that would have sounded impossible for us. But we are told that these words were carefully chosen. And we want to look at why Christ said, He perfect, even as your father is what? Is perfect. It says we need not look at ourselves. It says we need to look at who? At the Father and look at Jesus, the author and finisher of our what? Of our faith. Ellen White, in Mount of Blessings, that we want to look at as she comments on this. Very interesting commentary on uh, this Matthew 5, 8. Thoughts from Mount of Blessings, 77 and 78. Listen to what Ellen White says about this choice of words by Christ. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, <clears throat> page 77 and 78. She says, the Jews had been wearily toiling. The Jews had been wearily 
toiling to reach perfection by their own efforts, and they had failed. Christ has already told them that their righteousness could never enter the kingdom of heaven. I mean, who does not feel that way? Feel like, as in my, and we need to reach this point where I know that with my own righteousness, get into it. She continues, out to them the character of the righteousness that throughout the It says, throughout the sermon on the mount, he describes its fruits the fruits of righteousness. And now in one sentence, he points out its source and nature. Be perfect as God is perfect. The law is but a transcript of the character of God. Behold in your heavenly father, a perfect manifestation of the principles that are the foundation of his government. God is love. Like rays of light from the sun, Love and light and joy flow out from him to all creatures. It is his nature to give. His very life is the outflow of unselfish love. He tells us to be perfect as he is. Now listen to this carefully. He tells us to be perfect as he is in the same manner, same manner, not the same degree. We are to be centers of light and blessing to our little circle. Even as he is to the universe, we have nothing of ourselves but the light of his love shines upon us. We are to reflect its brightness. In his borrowed goodness, good, not mine, his goodness, I'm only a steward. He, she continues, in his borrowed goodness, we may be perfect in our sphere, even as God is perfect in his. God has a huge circle. I have a small cycle. He is saying I should be the center of light to my little cycle. We can do that if he abides in us. Continues, Jesus said, be as your father is perfect. If you are the children of God, you are partakers of his nature and you cannot but be like him. As in, if you become his children, if you partake of his nature, you cannot help, you cannot but be like him. You will be like him. It isn't striving to be good. You cannot avoid it if you partake of his nature. It is something that you cannot prevent from happening if you partake of his nature. She continues that every child lives by the life of his father. If you are God's children, begotten by his spirit, you live by the life of who? Of God. In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead body, Colossians 2.9. And the life of Jesus is made manifest in our mortal flesh, 2 Corinthians 4.11. That life in you will produce the same character and manifest the same works as it did in him. Thus you will be in harmony with every precept of his law. For the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. Psalm 19.7 Through love, the righteousness of the law will be fulfilled in us. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the what? But after the spirit. Listen to that commentary, commentary on Matthew. 548. This is amazing what we are reading here. We are seeing 
the righteousness that is required here, the righteousness by which we will enter heaven. It is obedience to the law. And what is the law? It is the transcript of God's character. And what is God's character? God is love. So righteousness is love. God so loved that he gave, he did something. It is a doing, not just avoiding the bad, doing of the good. He gave me the prince of love, prince of heaven. He gave me the God of love. Jesus lived a life of love for me and for his father. Behold what manner of love. And by beholding that love, I am transformed into his likeness. I love Christ and I love you until I am like who? Like Jesus. And when I am like Christ, I am like his father because the life of his father dwelt in his son. But now is manifest the righteousness of God and to all and upon all them that believe it comes by faith in who? In Christ. Many of us have misunderstood the righteousness that is required and we have struggled for long. We plead with Christ. We plead with God to stop from doing the negative. When God has been saying all along, he wants to give us the love that will not only eliminate the doing of the negative, but lead to the doing of acts of love, acts of righteousness. We have gotten the cart before the horse. We need to get the horse before the what? Before the cart. The power that enables a person to love others is in who? Is in Jesus. When you love them, you will not hate them. And when you love them, you will not lie to them. You will not cheat. You will not kill them. But you cannot make yourself like that. He transforms all who will receive him and he makes them right. It is his love, his righteousness that comes to us, we can receive it. We can believe with all our heart. We reach out and embrace it. In fact, it is difficult not to embrace it because you want so much to get it, especially if you have been struggling on your own and you come to the realization that time is short and you cannot be able to meet the standard of righteousness that is required to meet the demands of the law and to get into heaven. So it is wonderful. It is a wonderful message for the people of God and for the world in these last days. No wonder it is the third angel's message we are told in verity. Our problem that we have is understanding how God can love us so much when we are so unrighteous. When we read stories in the Bible of how he loved people like David and Moses, who was going to deliver Israel by killing an Egyptian. And he loved his disciple Peter, who wanted to kill those people who came to arrest Jesus. He only missed and chopped off his ear. Then it should not be a problem to us that God can be able to do what? To love us. This is the character that the world wants and needs to hear of God so that they can come to him and worship him and not run away from him like when he came to the garden and Adam and Eve were hiding themselves from him. This is the character that we must manifest in these last days. This is the glory that is supposed to fill the whole earth before the end comes. The question is, are we ready to understand? Are we ready to receive this love? Are we ready to be transformed so that our glory is laid to the dust and God can do for us that which is impossible for us to do? This is the question that I like to end, it, to end with today. And I hope that in our hearts we can be able to answer that we are opening our hearts. We are late, but God, may you work for us that which we cannot be able to work for ourselves, that which we have struggled to do for ourselves, yet the solution had already been given. We need to stop doing the negative. We need to receive the love of God in our hearts that will eliminate the negative and lead us to do good and manifest the character of God to the world. And may God bless us as we continue to contemplate upon these things in Jesus' name. Let us bow as I kneel for the last prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come.
come before you once again to thank you for the opportunity that you grant us even in these last days where we still have the freedom to freely, freely delve into your word, Father, and through the Holy Spirit to be able to understand, Father, and also to apply in our lives the teachings that you have for us and the promises that you have for us. Heavenly Father, may you transform us. First, our minds, Father, that you might understand these truths, Father. And then intellectually, Father, also apply them spiritually into our lives that we can become an experience. Father, that we might be able to manifest the glory that you have, which is the glory of love, Father. That you might be able to meet the righteousness that you require for us to get into heaven and to fit us also for that heavenly company. May you be with us for the rest of the day, Father, and the rest of the studies. Bless us all as we continue to open our minds, Father, on these studies, for this our prayer, trusting and believing in the precious name of Christ. Amen. Yes, Sam, so that is where we can stop so that you can get uh, the comments if there are any. Yes, we praise the Lord so much for the way he's uh, guiding us and uh, leading us even in the studies that uh, we are having. And I know daily we are growing into knowing what actually is uh, justification by faith, and not only having uh, a theoretical knowledge, but uh, surrendering ourselves so that uh, the justification of Jesus Christ may have uh, an experience in our lives. And so thank you so much. From Mitch, laborers in the course of truth should present the righteousness of Christ, not as a new light, but as precious light that has for a time been lost sight of by the people we are to accept of Christ as our personal savior and he imputes unto us the righteousness of God in Christ. Let us repeat and make prominent the truth that John has portrayed here in his love that we love God. Here, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 14, Selected Messages, Book 1, page 155, paragraph 2. And then Martin Mukaya is asking, I hope uh, Eric, you are listening. The term brethren in Matthew 25, 34 to 40 relates to all human beings or to people of the same faith. I believe it relates to all our neighbors. Amen. Uh, that is what he says. So it was kind of a question and an answer. That's the term brethren, more so as it appears in verse 40, as I have looked at it, uh, represent. Uh, the people of uh, same faith or everyone. You can look at it. I don't know if you have any other question or uh, addition. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, uh, thank you, Brother Eric, for the, the God, godly oriented uh, uh, presentation. Now, my my question is in regard to what is written in Ezekiel chapter 18 and Ezekiel chapter 33 in regard as being the watchman of others. Now, how, how can you briefly uh, link the presentation of today about us loving God and uh, our fellow human beings in relation to us also being the watchmen of our neighbors? Maybe what is the, how can you link that us being the watchmen of our neighbors, and also us being uh, as uh, yes, us being the watchmen of our neighbors in relation to uh, righteousness. How can we, or in brief, how can one preach the gospel to our neighbors who are in darkness? Yeah, I, I, if I'm getting you, I think. Uh, you know, as, as the probation is closing, time is getting shorter before it will finally close, we will need to give a message that is, uh, that, that, that is straight. Eh? It's like uh, someone is in a house and a fire has started. How you get them out 
will be a bit urgent. So if what I'm getting you, of course, this love, and like I've tried to get from the scripture and SOP, the, the, this love will be manifested in, in acts of love, yes. But like you're saying also, we are a watchman. We are a watchman. Eh? We need to point out to what is coming, which in these last days is becoming difficult because of what has happened in the world. Even our message as Adventists has become watered down because it is, it, it is seen like it is not loving to call people by, to use the biblical terms, to refer to what the Bible uh, uh, refers to, like the beast and all these things. So we find that now it is becoming tricky because the understanding of love has become so perverted to the extent that telling the truth, the truth has to be told, but in love, even what that means nowadays has become uh, muddied that you are told, no, you must speak the, the truth in love. Now you ask, how, how is that done? Then you, you, you don't get. So I get you. But if you look at the life of Christ, Christ always was in problems with the Pharisees. Now, did he love them or did he hate them? Of course, he loved them. Every time Christ healed someone, he told them to go and show themselves at the temple, not for the sake of that person, because he wanted the, those people at the temple, the scribes and the Pharisees, to actually see the miracles, if by chance they will be able to relook at their prophecies about the Messiah and actually see in Christ that the Messiah had done what had come. But as in the Desire of Ages, it says that the sharpest uh, words that he had for them was before he was crucified, because now there was no more time. So I think it was when he came to Jerusalem, eh? there was that festival, Passover. And then when he started telling them, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Actually, I told that the setting was, everybody was around and they were there. They thought it was a debate like usual. But Christ started speaking unto them, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, because you do this and this and this. And people were listening to them. It was love manifested, but when love is rejected so many times, it only leads to a hardening of the heart, which is the same principle that we look, we see in the Old Testament, when those plagues were falling in Egypt, the heart of Pharaoh, instead of becoming soft, only hardened to the extent that he had to lose his firstborn for him to release the Israelites. And then it was not because of remorse, it was because of the punishment, because he changed his mind again. So it was not, it did not lead him to, the Bible says what, godly, uh, whatever. it was not because he believed in God. So if I'm getting you, we really have to be, if we have, we, we, we really need to have that love and be led by the spirit fully so that we can be able to do what, we can be able to know what to do and what to say at what time. Because when time is so short, we love to say some of the things. No wonder that angel in Revelation 18 is seen as having so much power because the message is urgent and it has to be given in power because time is short. So I think that merging of uh, being a watchman and this character of love is something that if we are fully into God and we are led by the Spirit, we'll be able to guide us on what to do and what to say at what particular time. That's maybe what I can say for now. Thank you. Thank you for the wise counsel. I hope that is what you meant, uh, in the yes. same line of thought. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Brother Eric. May I comment briefly? I really appreciate the presentation. And uh, sorry, my name is appearing as Mitch, my son, but it's actually okay. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Eric, again. I wanted to really uh, emphasize something that you brought out. In John 8, 28, you brought out something that is uh, very profound. It's really profound to me, that the righteousness of Christ was not his own. It was his father's righteousness. And this is so important in this lesson because if Christ's righteousness was not his own, and yet we know he is perfect, he is an obedient and faithful son, 
how can we even claim to have a righteousness of our own? Mm -hmm. Or even earn it? How can we earn it? It is totally impossible. Yeah. Because Christ's righteousness, which he manifested, was his father's. And yet Christ is perfect in obedience, and he was sent. But how about us who are depraved, who are, in, who are carnal, who are born in sin, who practice and we ever think of sin on our own, it is just sin. Even the righteousness we think of is just sin. And so how much more do we need righteousness imputed unto us? rather than earning it by works, by our own uh, effort, it is totally impossible. And so it has to come from outside our, of ourselves. We cannot earn it. We cannot work for it. We cannot even plan for it. And it is so profound to me that he brought it up that Christ's righteousness was his father. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Welcome, Sister Florence. Okay. I also just wanted to make a, a quick comment. I think um, this is a, a very foundational truth to me. I mean, especially having come from a Catholic background um, several years ago, I think there are so many things I have learned. Some I have had to learn, you know, through small groups like this one and not in the mainstream. But uh, when I'm looking at what I have learned in the mainstream church, uh, especially uh, coming from that Catholic background, I think uh, mainly it was the Sabbath. I have learned about the state of the dead. I learned about the second coming among a few other things. And the very, very fundamental truths that I did not learn necessarily from the mainstream church, you know, one being the health message, it was neither here nor there, but um, I think I am now settled in the message of, you know, the ministry, you know, the, the, the medical missionary work. Um, and then I'm looking at the sanctuary again, very foundational but I did not learn it in the mainstream again. The one true God, very foundational again, but did not learn it in the mainstream. And so my burden is that how do we get these messages now to the people out there? Because even in the mainstream church, brethren, these messages are not there. And now what is mind blowing to me is the righteousness by faith, which is the core. And without which everything else actually collapses. And so for me, I think uh, as uh, maybe Brother Mokaya was saying, it is something that is urgent, but I also like the, the, the entire message because as we were discussing last Sabbath, it is so simple yet quite elusive, but I thank God that he has made it so clear and it comes out very succinctly in, in the sense that it is easy to understand. And I thank God for that. And especially you people who have been presenting this message. I think for me, um, with the reading that I've been doing, like in the whole of last week I was reading, I think it is becoming much clearer to me and it is compelling truth. And it is, it is really, as, as even the pioneers of faith were saying, this is a message that we need to take out, uplifting Christ who is our righteousness. Because without this, let me tell you friends, um, Everything else that we have been learning is analogy. And uh, because of that, I, I don't want to regret my past, but I think in the fullness of time it came for a reason, because then the Lord can use us right now to go out and take it out. And if we really understand it and we are settled in it, it is the Lord who's going to work in us to take it to the rest of the people in church and even the ones who are out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And that's just a comment I wanted to make, but it is compelling truth and I thank God. I feel like it's, um, it's a new birth, as in it's, it's something that I'm, I'm wondering why I didn't know it, because 
I've, I'm beginning to get hold of this one thing that you know I've been lacking. Because you hear people mention in passing, you know, righteousness by faith. But no one, no one really gets, you know, to, to hold it and you know bring it out clearly. And so I'm thanking God for that. And I pray that we all pray for one another, that it becomes that clear so that we are able also to go out and, and you know take it to the rest of the brethren. Thank you, Brother Eric. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Eric, and uh, the, the people who have made the comments. I, I'd like to say this as uh, maybe we close. There's something that I have, when I was listening to Eric speaking, something struck me so much that I, I have to share, because if I don't share this, uh, I think maybe it can escape my mind or it may not have a benefit of hearing it. That in receiving the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we receive life, original and borrowed and derived yeah. and that is the thing and i want you to see it on the screen how sister white brings it out so clearly and i thank eric for presenting this when he was talking about that um, christ did not have his own righteousness but he received his righteousness from the father and that is why christ says in john chapter 5 verses uh, 25 and 26 that uh, as the father has life in himself, so he has given the son to have life in himself. And uh, I, I, want, I want us to see when you receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you are receiving original and borrowed life. Look at uh, John chapter 10, 18, and the commentary that follows. In him was... If he believe in Christ as his personal savior, this is eternal life that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. This is the open fountain of life is to have an intimate relationship with the original and borrowed life. Look at how it continues. Giving his charge to Timothy, Paul says, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness. Goodness, faith, love, patience, meekness, this is the faith. And hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So, by having the fruit of the Spirit, which is righteous, derived. This is why Peter says in Second Peter one four that unto us has been given exceeding precious promises that we may be partaking of life after escaping the corruption that is in the world. This is the thing. Justification by faith leads us to receiving original and borrowed life. The righteousness of Jesus Christ, the eternal life, this is what we are striving for. And no man can have the righteousness that can earn him original and borrowed and derived life. The believer can just have it when he believes in Jesus Christ as a personal savior. This is the thing. You cannot earn it. You cannot earn righteousness. You cannot do righteousness. Just like you cannot earn original and borrowed uh, and derived life. Uh, another place that she brings this one also is that, uh, yes, in him was the original and borrowed and derived life. This is in Maranatha 302. While bearing human nature, he Christ was dependent upon the omnipotent for his life. So you see that Christ's righteousness was the righteousness of, of the Father. He Christ was dependent upon the omnipotent for, he, for his life. He, he depended on the Father. In his humanity, he laid hold of the divinity of God. And this, every member of the human family has the privilege of doing. He was given life. And he was able to do righteousness by depending on the Father. And now if we hold on him, we have the privilege of also having this after escaping the corruption in the world. Lastly, he says, if we repent of our transgression, see how the original and borrowed life is 
linked with repenting of our transgression. If we repent our transgression and receive Christ as the life giver, we become one with him and our will is brought into harmony with the divine will. We become partakers of the life of Christ, original and borrowed and derived, which is eternal. We have lost you. Every immortality from God by receiving the life of Christ. This message is so sweet. I don't know what else I can talk about it, but may the Lord be with us and uh, continue guiding us as even we seek being one. And with the Father and the Son. You have a good lunch as we prepare for our evening at 3 p.m. Invite others so that they may be able to hear these glad tidings. And please, let us go and share the messages. How can you hear the message? Just sit. We must go and be able to. Amen. Amen.